Driving Culture Report. This is Hype Beast Radio. We're sitting here with Angelo Bucquet. I'm your co-host, Madrell. Ben Rosen. Cool. And uh, how's it going, Angelo? Going well. Um, it's nice early in the morning, yeah. which I like. I feel, uh, feel awake, no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And for all the listeners, uh, could you just let them know like where we are currently? We are in... Um, we are at 99 Canal Street, uh, Chinatown, New York. Um, we are at uh, Ground Zero for Bake Creative. Um, yeah, yeah, we're in my we're in my little space. Yeah, how how is it to like you know open up this space? It's been amazing. It's been um, quite uh, interesting and. Uh, liberating to uh, finally have something that's mine. Uh, it's the first time ever, you know, ever since I was a kid. Since I was 13, I've always had a boss. You know, I've always worked for someone. So, you know, at the age of 38 to finally venture off and start my own thing, it's scary as shit. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's quite liberating. Yeah, it's, it's been an interesting experience. Awesome. Good to hear. So, um, yeah, as discussed, like, you know, like the, with the podcast, we like to have it be dire- um, educational. That's like the direction of the podcast. And we get like, you know, the backstories of, you know, just influential creatives within our space. So with that being said, like, you know, we're going to go all the way back to the beginning. You know, how did you first get your, you know, entry into fashion? Um, how did I first get my entry into fashion? I, I mean, I'm, I'm a native New Yorker and part of growing up here is, Um, you want to look good you know like this is a city where there's a lot of interaction you know like the minute you walk out your doorstep you're being judged you know whether you like it or not and um, you know so for me like that first layer before you can even get to know me you know like you could look at my clothes you know like and growing up in the time period that I you know I was very fortunate to grow up in the you know 80s and 90s where you know my idols I wanted to look like my idols, you know, my idols were Big Daddy Kane, Rakim, Slick Rick, um, and, and for me they always, they look cool, you know, to me they always look fucking cool. Uh, and then in the 90s, you know, Grand Puba was a big inspiration for me, and, and then I got introduced to the world of polo, and you know, uh, you, you finally, like, I don't know, it was weird, man, like, it's not weird, but... It, Having like a cool like jacket or a hat can go a long way with women, you know, when I was a yeah. teenager. So like once I started kicking in, like, you know, I wanted like that, that female attention, you know, like there was even more, of, there was more pressure to look good and to kind of like get my shit together, you know? Yeah. Yeah. What were you wearing at the time? I was wearing, I was wearing <laughs> the Gap. <laughs> Gap was really fucking cool back then. You know, we're talking like, you know, 1990 two, three, four, you know, those are my high school years, 92 to 96. So, you know, like, it was like a big deal to own like a pair of Jabo jeans, you know, like I remember I got my first pair of like Brand X Jabo jeans and that was like major, like my first Hilfiger piece, my first polo piece, you know, and then mixed with like random band tees. Like if you get your hands like on a Cypress Hill tee, you know, like that was a big fucking deal. Or, you know, I started going to like, open mic events and hip hop shows and like to get like the actual like merch, you know, was a big deal. You know, I grew up in Queens, you know, like nobody, nobody was wearing like uh, a Boogie Monsters tee or Souls of Mischief, you know, like anything like from the West Coast was really cool if you get your hands on like hip hop wise. You mentioned Polo, were you like a part of the whole Low Life scene? Was that something you no, were involved I wasn't, in? I was, I was not part, Low Lives, here's the thing, like Low Lives started out in, uh, in Brownsville. Uh, Shouts to um, to the OG uh, low lives out there, and then it transitioned to the RFC crew uh, like around 1992, and I was like just a little bit too young, you know what I mean? Like those dudes were like probably like four years older than me, and um, like running around like in the village and downtown. By the time I started like really really hanging out on Broadway, a lot of those dudes had transitioned into like just worse things, you know what I mean? Like whether it's like stealing cars or drugs or whatever it is you know what i mean like there's always kind of like this next level of whatever uh, they could get off the truck yeah of cri- like of of criminality you know what <laughs> you know what i mean like so like by the time i came around like i was like 
I was writing really bad poetry, like in 1996. You know, like I read like the like uh, <laughs> like uh, the autobiography of Che Guevara, and you know, I started I started getting more kind of like self enlightened. Like I, I went to I went to community college, and you know, I just started running with a completely different crew than what my crew looked like in high school. Yeah, and as a um, as a college student, were you like doing any like jobs and stuff in your downtime? Yeah, I mean, I, I got involved, I started going to the New Eureka Poets Cafe, like around 94, 95, through my boy Bazaar, like he put me on, he put me on to the New Eureka Poets Cafe, and like that's where I saw like Erica Badu for the first time, and Mo's Duff, and Talib Kweli, and like all these punch, uh, punchline and Wordsworth, like all these dudes, you know, um, and I wanted to be somehow involved in this kind of like movement, and so I started taking pictures. Um, so between like writing like really bad poetry, I would take like pretty shitty photos too. Um, and then I started pursuing photography like from 96 to, I would say like 96 to 98, I really started kind of like, all right, like this is it, this is what I wanted to do. Prior to that, I thought I was gonna be a social studies teacher. Um, and then I realized that all the history that we were learning was all a lie, so and then I felt like, I felt hypocritical to want to go teach history. That was bullshit. That was the Che Guevara talking. Yeah, right? it was the Che Guevara. Absolutely. Um, that was that was a pretty like shifting moment in my life. That you know, I will say that kind of like was was pretty important. That kind of got me off the block. Like got me off that block mentality into more of a more like city mentality. I can't even say it was glo global. Like I just knew like from a very early age that I just didn't want to be a kid from Queens. You know, like as much as I love being from Queens, like. I wanted to be downtown, I wanted to be at the parties, I wanted to be at, you know, the hip hop shows, at the art openings. Like, I was, I was lucky that I had an older sister that was obligated to take me everywhere. Yeah. You know, like I come from like a traditional super immigrant Ecuadorian family, so my sister fucking hated me because she had to take me wherever she went. So like, when I was 10 years old, I was able to hang out on Broadway with her. So mm -hmm. this is like 1988, like, you know what I mean? Like shit was like really popping off. Like, doesn't like Broadway now is like abandoned, you know what I mean? Right. But like Broadway, like back in the late 80s and early 90s was just like, had the coolest fucking stores. There was this place called uh, Unique Boutique where like you walked in and someone like airbrushed your jean jacket and then they had like a glow in the dark room and like all the fucking weirdos worked there. And you know, I got my first job downtown uh, when I was 18 at this store called Canal Jean Company. And it was the same thing, like in the basement was like all the vintage stuff. And it was huge, you, you know where the Bloomingdale store is yeah. now? Yeah. That was Canal Jean Company. Oh wow. So it was four floors. So in the basement was the vintage where all, like all the art students worked and the, the the, fl the floor that you would walk in was like, there was a huge cash wrap and they would get like all the hot girls from Avenue D to work there because they it like, it would bring all the guys in. And then like Levi's was on the top floor and they had like all the good looking people yeah. up there. It was cool, man. It was like this weird cash system of retail. But, and I worked in the men's department, you know? So that was like, that was like my real, real kind of like entrance into like retail and learning what it is to merchandise and buy and all that stuff. And so how did you make the transition from like Broadway to like the streetwear scene? Was that like a smooth transition? Uh, I got this job through my boy Vaz, who used to manage Bobito's Footwork, which was a small like boutique that was like pre, like they were the first ones to like carry sneakers and all that stuff. Yeah, like pre-flight club. Pre-flight pre club and all like, they had like a small Nike account This and Union, already had existed, but Union didn't really have the sneaker element. Like, Bobby, like Bobito really focused on the records and the kicks, you know, which was kind of new. And they were also heavily involved in that, like, open mic scene, you know what I mean? Like, right. that was kind of like hand in glove. And like, so streetwear, there was no word that didn't exist, yeah. you know what I mean? It was like independent clothing, you know what I mean? So it was just like, basically what your man's was printing in his backyard, yeah. you know what I mean? Or like in, in his garage or basement, he would bring it into the city and try to sell it to Union or Bobbito. Um, those were kind of like the platforms. Um, so my transition, so yeah, my boy Vaz got me this job with this dude, Trevor, uh, who was doing this t-shirt line called Double Down. And he took me to Magic in like 99, 98, 99. And that's where I met Jeff Staple, I met Scott Sasso, I met Wayne C.O.D. Like these dudes were like literally- OGs. OGs, they were carrying their own shit to Magic, setting up their own booths with their family members. Like it was pretty fucking cool when I was 19, you know what I mean? So like that was my first kind of like, 
you know, understanding. And at the same time, my boy Chris Gibbs, who now, who now owns Union LA, was just a shop guy at the Union New York store. And I met him at the New York Recon back in like 95. So like, he would like hook me up with a discount on t-shirts here and there, like, cause that shit was expensive for us. Yeah, you know yeah, what yeah. I mean? Like a $28 t-shirt, a $32 t-shirt. Like You're 19 years old. That shit is like a $300 t-shirt today. You know what I mean? So like to get like 20% off on a t-shirt was like a big fucking deal. Or he'll just like something that didn't sell, be like, yo, here, you, you can rock that. And I'm like, oh man, good looking out. Um, so yeah, like, through, that was kind of like my inception into this world and I worked at the fader as a photo assistant in 99 under Jeff Staple. He kind of brought me in because then I was really pursuing the photography thing and um, I worked under him and Eddie Brannon and that was kind of like the best like free education that I got you know because I was trying to transition from community college to SVA which was really fucking difficult for me. Right. And it's not easy, you know what I mean? Like a lot of people don't, like, that's fucking hard. Like to get out of community college is fucking hard. That's just a trap. And um, he was like, yeah, he was really nice. He took, he took me under his wing and he taught me, you know, how to lay out, uh, you know, how basically how to lay out magazine, like how to balance typography and images. And then this dude, Eddie Brennan, taught me how to like properly, you know, review somebody's work, you know, like how to open up. Because back then, like you would hold a portfolio in hand, you know, now like people show with their fucking iPads, you know what I mean? But back in the day, like you would drop off your, your portfolio to a magazine and hope that they looked at it, you know? Yeah. Um, then after that, um, and I was working like really shitty, like retail jobs in between like Club Monaco, Urban Outfitters, you know, like I was just hustling, you know, I was like trying to work Friday through Sunday to have enough money to like, to take my girlfriend out for like, Red Lobster or some shit like that, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, like yeah. something really, like, I thought that was really nice back then. Or like BBQ's on A Street, which was like kind of popping back then. Still an establishment. <laughs> yeah, still an establishment. And um, yeah, I was struggling, man. I was really fucking struggling. And then um, I needed a job and I was like, Jeff, I need a fucking job because they weren't paying me at the fader. And I was like, fuck that place. I didn't want to work there anymore. And he was like, well, let me introduce you to this dude, James. He's, he's, he has a store called Stussy. And I was like, yeah, I know, I know about it. Well, they're moving from Prince Street to Wooster and they need kids to work in the store. So, you know, I'll set you up with an, with an interview. And I was like, cool. So like, I went to go meet James. He looked at me up and down and he was like, hmm. And I was like, all right. And he was like, so you work for Double Down? Yeah, they're okay. And I'm like, all right, cool. And he goes, I'll call you. And then like a day later, he's like, hey, um, I need you in front of the store at 9 a.m. And I was like, cool. And that was like, that was the real kind of right. introduction because I didn't really know shit. You know, I didn't know about COJPs. I didn't know about Neighborhood or Bape or, you know, um, Double Taps. I didn't know. And none of that stuff registered. Do you know what I mean? Like right. up until that point, like what I was really focused into was kind of like, New York City based clothing or like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, just like more like either it's New York or LA, not like what's cool in London or what's cool in Tokyo. Yeah, you know, the entire so, Harajuku, like, yeah, streetwear. like, and that shit was popping back then. You know, yeah, like, what's on now? This is the year 2000, 2001. Like, this shit is like cracking. Like, you had like, you know, the uncle movement, you know what I'm saying? So, like, we have all these British dudes come in, like, with babe sneakers and fucking Avisu jeans and, you know, like, the babe camel jacket. And it's just like, fuck, like, that shit is dope, you know? Like, or they would have, like, you know, like a Stussy hoodie or, like, a Supreme, you know, something. You know what I mean? Like, it was, like, it was, it was weird. It was interesting and weird going into that world. You know, it was quite humbling because, you know, like, I didn't, you know, like my attitude was like, I'm from New York, I know it all. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> yeah. you can't tell me nothing, you know? Like, I'm from Queens. I'm from Queens, you know what I'm saying? So like, so to go there and kind of like get this understanding, like my my uh, my boss at the time was Chris Keefe and he's like one of the OG Supreme Supreme team dudes. And he introduced me to like Max Fish and like all the other dudes, you know, like it was, it was weird because they weren't having it. Like when I first started coming around, like who the fuck is this kid? Like I had yeah. hair down on my shoulders. I was wearing like a Che Guevara tee. I was gonna say, yeah, 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 yeah. like you know, they're like, like a fucking hippie. You know what I mean? Like, and all these dudes have already been hanging out for like 15 years. Yeah. You know, like they've been skating the banks and go, hanging out downtown, and you know, so it was like it was interesting, kind of like coming around and like being, you know, little by little being taken, like taken under a new wing. You know, like mm -hmm. skate wing, because I also didn't know shit about skateboarding. You know? Right. Up until that point, I still don't know much about skateboarding, but like, I really didn't know anything about skateboarding in the year 2000, 2001, so that was pretty cool. And while working at um, Stussy, you also met Will Whitney, who helped you like get into Nom de Guerre. Yeah, so Will, after Chris left, Chris left to go manage Supreme, 
Will came in and uh, me and Will hit it off immediately. Will's from Long Island, I'm from Queens, so you know, it's like peanut butter and jelly, you know, like we got along. And I understood that Will was a little older than me and you know, like I just got like a, I got like an old work ethic, you know, you know what I mean? Where it's like you kind of just put your head down and shut up and work and you, like you respect your elders. And I, like, I think Will acknowledged that like immediately, like he recognized that. And you know, he really, at, at that time also I started up Absurd, like my first t-shirt line. And he like, he backed it. Um, and I, you know, like, I had like some, I was working at Sportswear International as a photo editor and juggling Stussy and going to SVA, like, and I just like, I needed something to kind of break, you know what I mean? Like I, I needed, I needed support and Will recognized that and he's like, yo, he pulled me to the side one day. He's like, yo, I'm gonna quit in like three months. And I met this dude, Issa, he has a boutique in Williamsburg called Issa. And um, we're gonna start our own sneaker store on Broadway. And he's like, I want you to come manage the store and bring Absurd with you. And I'm like, all right, fuck it, yeah, let's do it. You know what I mean? I was like, well, I ain't got nothing else better going on. I was like, because shit, like, uh, I'm broke. Yeah, so, yeah, I needed that opportunity. And that was another kind of, like, stepping stone education, um, you know, process for me. You know, like, uh, Issa, at the time, was very, he was, just, he, was, he was just way ahead. You know what I mean? Like, he had a store in Brooklyn that carried Marc Jacobs and Rag and & Bone and Rogan. You know what I mean? Uh, like he, like this is we're talking to 2003. You yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Like this shit. This is not the Williamsburg that has the Apple Store and Whole Foods and all the fucking craze that's over there right now. You know what and I mean? The Supreme so, now. And there's a Supreme now, correct? Um, so this, you know, it, you know, it, I didn't get it. Once again, I was wearing old navy jeans in 2003. Like I didn't give a fuck. You know, like I, you know, I had a cool Stussy sweatshirt and a Supreme hat and some fucking like, you know, limited dunks, you know, like the last thing you cared about was, at least for me, was your jeans. I was like, whatever. And then, so then like, I'm, like through that, I like, I was taught like, you know, raw denim, Japanese raw denim, you know, uh, what you might call it, uh, chain stitching, like all this shit. Like I, you know, like it was cool, man. Like they gave me an opportunity and a platform to really do my thing. Like taught me how to do proper buying for a store, how to merchandise. Um, that allowed me to like contribute ideas for the collection and like um, I'll tell you something that was pretty cool in the building that we, we were on the corner of Bleecker and Broadway like adjacent to where um, Kiff Atrium is right and so we were sub level so this lady used to come down and hang out with us and um, one day she was like you know I used to take pictures in the 80s and I was like yeah whatever you know like everyone always used to come down and tell their story and she was like, I should show you something. I'm like, yeah, I was like, bring them down. And so she brought down like her book of Polaroids and it was like Sade, Basquiat, Vincent Gallo, like all these like heavy hitters. I'm like, whoa, I was like, who the fuck are you? And she was like, I'm Mary Pohl, you know, I'm gonna put out a book, you know, like uh, it's gonna be good. And I was like, oh, no shit is gonna be good. So I was like, let us host like your book opening. You yeah. know? And I feel like that was a cool turning point. You know, like she lived upstairs in the building and, super sweet and you know it's kind of those things like that was you know kind of right place right time mm -hmm. so when we launched the Brooklyn store we we turned over Issa to Norm Naguerre and in that process we were we were we launched Mary Pohl's book so it was, it was a good vibe you know yeah. and then after that we hosted the Maharishi book and I did a thing for my friend Todd Jordan so I was able to like start curating shows and get involved in the art scene Cool. Yeah. yeah. And how did how did you transition from so it was like you transitioned from Gnome to Gear to Supreme after that? Correct. Um, I got a random phone call from James. He was like, "Hey, um, I got some opportunities over here. You know, I might open up a neighborhood store. I also need, you know, support with Supreme. Uh, what do you think?" And then, um, you know, for me, I always compare that to like getting like a phone call from George Steinbrenner. Yeah, you know yeah, what yeah. I mean? Like, Major was, leagues. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like, yo, that's like that's cool what you're doing down there, you know. But like, you want to come play on the big show, you know? Like, come fuck with me, you know? So I was like, shit. I was um, I was really flattered. I was like, okay, and nervous. Mm -hmm. You know, like that was like literally like 20 interviews <laughs> to yeah. get to get hired. You know? Was that because like you know you didn't they didn't you didn't have an idea of what you wanted to do at Supreme or like was there like not a defined title? There wasn't a defined title, you know, um, and I didn't really have a predecessor, you know, uh, prior to me showing up there was there was Aaron, uh, Aaron Bondaroff, who was kind of like the face spokesperson, like went around hooking people up, you know, like, um, and nothing, uh, nothing 
stable or established, you know, with a title or like yeah. someone consistently there, you know, like day in, day out sitting in the office. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that was, that was kind of like just being able to kind of formulate what it is and that I can do and what it is that I can bring to the table. Mm -hmm. And at the time, it was like bringing experience that you learned from like Nam Daguerre with like, you know, curating art shows and then also like pitching ideas for like fashion collections. It's a accumulation of everything, everything. I just told you, yeah, you yeah. know, so from the fader up the until, fader up until then, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. it's like it's like bringing the photo background to the table, bringing merchandising essentially is styling, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So like I used to have to do the mannequins at Gnome or whatever store, like bullshit store I worked at, you know, and um, by then, like even my style had kind of like progressed, you know, like I, you know, being able to pull from the from the past or think what might look good in the future, you know. Um, yeah, it was it was a complete 360 of of everything I had learned ten years prior to that, you know, mm -hmm. like basically like 18 to 28, like that decade um, brought me, you know, brought me to that point of having the skills to work for Supreme. Yeah, and I feel like the, and we talk about this a lot, like we said, it's kind of an educational thing, so we have a lot of people that have like creative director and branding director is sort of like something that they have as a title, yeah. and it's always hard for people to know from the outside what that really entails, but it's kind of like you really do have to bring that jack of all trades. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. and and uh, and own it, um, and really execute, I mean, I think, I guess like the big conversation amongst my friends, you know, I'm, I'm a little older, I'm 39 now, you know, and, and it took me, you know, like in my 39th year being my own business owner to be like, yeah, I'm the creative director of Bake Creative, like this shit is mine, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, and it's like, it's a very loosely used term nowadays, right. you know, in particular with like Instagram, you know, like under everyone's like little like avatars, like creative director, like art director, and it's like, mind-blowing you know what i mean like I, I wish you i knew it was that easy <laughs> you know yeah. so like give myself a self-appointed title like that you yeah. know like a uh, creative consultant it's like fuck you know um it's interesting man because you see i feel like every it's cyclical right because yeah. i feel like every 10 years or i feel like maybe every five years in our world like there's like a new trend the new fad of like titles and jobs and consultants and yada 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 and eventually it all goes away you know what I mean? Like, and if you just let your work speak for itself, like, you'll be fine. You know, like, I, I've, I've, I've come to the realization why I don't like doing shit like this is because I also know, like, it gives me, it, like, for me, it's like, one, I don't want to hear my fucking story again. You know, like, I think it gets, it gets boring, you know, like, because it doesn't get any more exciting, you know, unless we start talking about the future, right? Because the yeah. past already has happened. And, you know, this is maybe like the fourth time I've done like this interview purposefully, you right? Because I don't, Cause I know after a while, kids are like, I don't want to fucking hear this old dude, you know. Because I used to, I used to be that kid, you yeah. know. But it was never like this, where it was recorded, and you can listen to over and over again. Like most of the time, it was word of mouth. Like right. Right. you'll sit on the stoop, and some old head will start talking about how it was back in the days, and you're just like, Dah. you have the option to get up and walk away. Like I don't yeah. want to listen to this old motherfucker anymore. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like, but then occasionally it's like the Mary Paul comes into the studio yeah, and tells and then, that shit. And that's, that's where the humility kicks in and like you have to have an open mind and you yeah. have to listen because you just, you never know where that message is going to come from that day. You know what I mean? Like it could be from a fucking UPS worker, it could, come, it could be from your intern, it could be like from someone that's older, you know what I mean? And I think like that's, that's definitely if anything has helped me um, in my career also is like just having humility to admit that I don't know it all. Yeah. I, I don't think I'm like the ultimate cool guy. I don't think like I'm the ultimate like end all be all when it comes to clothing or you know photography or magazines or music or art. Like I some, I sometimes I just don't know shit. Like talk to me, tell me, tell me what you know. And that's why I like talking to kids. You know, yeah. what I'm saying? I like I like talking to people that are younger than me because like I'm I'm genuine I'm genuinely curious. You know what I'm saying? Like I feel like most times like when people in my position want to talk to people that are younger is because they don't know and they want to capitalize on it. Yeah, for You sure. know what I'm saying? They want to exploit it and they want to expose it and, you know, they want to uh, commodify it. You know what I mean? But like for me, it's, it's an exchange, right? Because, because I have the benefit of living a little bit more than you and having more experience that I, I, I genuinely can help you with what it is that you want. You know what I mean? Whether it's like you want to pursue styling or, you know, art directing, creative directing, uh, you know, designing, uh, photography, you know what I mean? Like, 
I'm here. You know, and it sounds like they can also help you in a way because they can absolutely. put you on game. Oh, I have 100. You know, so I was like, I know, I know what I bring to the table. What do you bring to the table? Mm -hmm. You know, which is my favorite response to my DMs. You know, kids are like, I fuck with your vision. I fuck what you do. You know, like I want to fucking work with you. And I'm like, and then my response is, well, what do you do? And then usually it's just crickets. You know what uh... I mean? Yeah, it's like, uh, you know, it's like. I have 400 square feet to make shit happen. You know what I mean? Like this, this spot is not to like just fucking like dick around all day. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you want to help me, tell me how you can help me. You know what I mean? Like, I'm all for it. You know what I mean? And if you're that good, I'll fucking pay you. You know what I'm saying? But like, to just say like, you know, because then they're running game on me, right? Yeah. Because most of the time, like, you get gassed on that shit. Like, oh, why are you fucking my vision? And then you're like, ah, my vision is so amazing. You know? It's like at the end of the day, like. That's bullshit, you know what I mean? Because this shit changes every day, you know what I mean? Like, what I like, what I think, what yeah. I appreciate, what I love, what I hate, you know? Like, it's, you know, it's peaks and valleys, you know? So, like, it's funny, you know? Like, I've watched some of my peers fall for that shit. I'm like, why do you got this kid hanging around? This kid fucking does nothing, you know what I mean? Like, I don't, I don't need yes men or yes women, you know? Like, I need doers. I need people that are going to execute. I feel like that's another fun part of, like, the whole, like, you were saying, like, the social media thing. I like, people will be like, I'm a creative director now. And then and at the same time, they can also reach out to you a lot easier and kind of like try to get that residual clout. You know what I mean? Like oh, they'll yeah. reach out and they're just like, hey man, I fuck with you. And it's like, thanks man. I don't, I don't really know what to do with that statement. It doesn't really, like, what do you do? And then like you said, they don't have an answer for it. Yeah. Like have, have, I feel like it's just because it's so easy for them to reach out to you now. Like yeah. in, the, in the 90s, they would have had to... Oh, you, you, yeah, you. you had to like, oh, you, you got to go through the many kind of like levels, you know, yeah. and then like, yeah, it's like trial by, interviews. Yeah, like, yeah, exactly. Trial by fire. And yeah. like, you know, either you're going to it's sink or swim, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And, and a lot of these kids can't deal with, you know, with just honesty, you know what I'm saying? Because, you know, you're, you've been told your whole life that you're special and, and not saying that you're not, but it's like you got to you got to work for that special thing. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You're not just born special you know i fucking wasn't born special you know i still don't think i'm special i just i think i'm very fortunate that i've been able to you know excel in you know in my career you know like my mother told me i was gonna be a bum you know when i told my mother i was gonna pursue photography she was like you're gonna be a beggar you know like and had i listened to her you know i, I would have just fucking settled for being a school teacher or like some other like blue, like blue collar job you know my mother came from ecuador in 1969 you know couldn't speak english and you know, it was hard for her and she became a nurse, you know, so like I see how she wanted that American dream for me. But this is like this is the new American dream, you know, mm -hmm. like being an entrepreneur, you know, like she still doesn't understand what the fuck I do for a living. You know, she knows that I travel a lot and then, you know, like every once and she knows that I got food on the table. So she's really happy. She's proud of it. She's proud of me, but she still doesn't understand what I do for a living. You know, it's kind of amazing. Mm -hmm. And so like speaking of the entrepreneur stuff, so at what point during the Supreme thing, did you kind of start thinking about Bake Creative as your own? Like, when, when did that idea come about and how does Awake fit into that? Uh, well, Awake started five years ago. I think I used to work with this company, Ships, in Tokyo. And about, about that time, they wanted to start kind of like reviving all these New York brands. They were my biggest Japanese client. So they wanted to originally bring back away, um, I'm sorry, Absurd, and I just thought that that was whack. I like that my brand never really blew up. Mm -hmm. You know, like, it's, it, this is around the time, like, when, like, the hundreds became a big deal and 10 deep, you know, like, streetwear was, like, that first, like, streetwear mm -hmm. bubble was, like, yeah, yeah. boom, the you know? Graphic tea the bubble. graphic tea bubble, like, the all-over print bubble, you know? And I was, like, and I was just, like, fuck. And I was, like, one of those dudes that just kept it real and kept it real broke, you know what I mean? And I'm, like, I'm just gonna keep it real absurd. I'm not gonna do all-over prints, fuck that shit. And um, so I was like, I don't want to bring that. I, li I like that it kind of, it was like an aging boxer that just went away, you know, like with mm -hmm. like a, let's just say like a, a 49 in one record. You know yeah, what yeah. I mean? Like, Not cool. with a bang, but with a whimper. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like you, you, you did good, you did good champ. You know what I mean? And um, so I was like, no, I won't do that. How about I just create something new for just you guys? You know, cause I also didn't want to get back into the actual like production fashion game. You know what I mean? That shit is a fucking headache. So I, I created a deal with them where I just I just designed strictly for ships. Um, you know, here's the thing too, you know, like I've always kept busy while working at Supreme. You know, like I, I, I kept contributing to magazines, I kept taking pictures, you know, like um, you know, creating, you know, curating art shows. Um, you know, like I just I 
I knew for me, like being a creative person that like I couldn't just work, you know, at Supreme, like, you know, like I love the job and it and definitely consumed a lot of my time. But at the same time, for me to kind of like balance my sanity, I needed to, get, like, to do other things, you know, so like when I was given the opportunity to do to work with shifts, like, you know, of course I jumped on it to like just have an outlet for just to make fun stuff. You know what I mean? Like, um, because the truth is like, if it isn't Supreme or Polo or APC, like I'm not really wearing it. You know what I mean? Like I've been, I'm stuck in my ways, you know, like, I'll, like I'll, I'll, you know, like every once in a while, like I'll gravitate towards like a new Japanese brand or something like, like really random weird shit or something I'll find in Paris, but for the most part, a bulk of my fucking clothes are Supreme, APC, and Polo, you know what I mean? So I wanted to make stuff that, like, I couldn't find within those three kind of, like, you know, platforms. Yeah, the big three. The big three. For me, my big three, you know? Um, so that's, that's where a week started. Um, you know, I just, time, you know, that, that was a big issue, you know? So, like, as I grew in career with Supreme, you know, more of my friends would ask me for help, and you know, occasionally a, a brand will ask me, you know, to come and do consulting. And, but the truth is I couldn't dedicate the, the right amount of time to justify getting that pay. You know, I'm not big on taking people's money and not doing shit, not earning it. You know what I mean? Like for me, like if you're going to give me a retainer or whatever it is, or you're going to commission me a budget to produce like a film or, you know, like an interview or whatever it is, like I want to give you the best product possible, you know? So, um, it was probably like around the Paris store opening that I realized like, all right, you know, like I'm coming on 10 years of working for this brand. I had an amazing run here. And, you know, um, I think it's time for me to kind of like to start creating my own thing. You know what I mean? Cause like, I knew what I wanted my thirties to look like, you know, that was another thing. When I hit 25, I hit, I hit like that, oh shit, like quarter life crisis. Like what the fuck am I going to do with myself? Like, and you know, so I kind of mapped out what, you know, 30 and then 30 to 40 would look like so now i had to start thinking like what the fuck does 40 to 50 look like yeah. you know what is because you know like i'm not trying to be like a, an old dusty streetwear guy you know what i mean like yeah and that's like a weird age when you're in the streetwear scene too yeah and you know for me and i'm strict i'm strictly talking for myself you know like i you know like for me i i started seeing what that started looking like for me and where I didn't want to see myself and where I did want to see myself. And ultimately it's to kind of like just work on cool and interesting creative projects. You know what I mean? And kind of like owning stuff that's mine. You know, like I can never, I can never claim any type of like ownership of Supreme or any of the projects, you know, cause ultimately all those things are, they're all like a group process. You know what I'm saying? I can say I contribute you know, I've definitely contributed to the brand over 10 years, you know what I mean? But I don't own anything. Whereas like here now, Awake is mine, Bakke Creative is mine. And then the next project that I'm working on for our Basel is mine, that I'm being able to, I'm, a, I'm able to kind of bring all my friends together too. You know, yeah. Yeah. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it makes perfect it sense. Sense. yeah. I think uh, we were talking about this on the walkover about like the contributions thing. Cause like when the, when the French store, when the Paris store opened, like in that collection, there was like the Sade t-shirt and you literally were like, that's my love letter basically yeah. like before you dipped. Yeah. Was that basically sort of like the idea? Like it's kind of like there is like a contribution like that. No, so. I think that's just osmosis, man. Like yeah. I've been fucking playing Sade and wearing Sade t-shirts for the last 10 years and you know, in the office, you know, yeah. and that's something that I constantly was trying to like pitch and, you know, ultimately like, it's cool that it got done. You know, even that, I can't take ownership for that. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? Like that's, I didn't lay out the t-shirt, you know what I'm saying? Like that's, you know, that's just me being there. Yeah. You know, the same thing Morrissey, you know, like I can't claim ownership of that, you know, but have I been listening to Morrissey for the last 10 years? Like in that office and wearing Morrissey t-shirts, you know, like, it, you know, like I think we get, we all get inspired from one another. You know, like I took a huge inspiration from Supreme. You know what I mean? For me to say that Supreme doesn't influence Awake, I'd be lying. You know what I mean? Like it goes both ways. Yeah. So speaking of Awake, you mentioned like you know a project that you're doing at Art Basel. Um, could you talk more about that? Yeah. So um, recently, I did um, I did the programming for the Virgil Ten Space with Nike here on Wall Street, and why Nike came to me <laughs> was they wanted to do something that was a little more in depth and substantial than just doing a pop up where kids show up and it's like, all right, come buy the shit and I'll get the fuck out. You know, like it's like, come and chill. 
you know what I mean? So um, came up with the concept to like have these conversations based around like Virgil's creative process and like juxtap like the bring in these people where it's like these weird juxtapositions of inspirations of his mm -hmm. or like you can bring like a Venus X or a Spike Lee or a Laylee or Don C, um, Eric Costin, uh, Benji B, you know what I mean? And yeah. none of it sounds off because ultimately it's like, it's the one degree of separation of Virgil, you know what I mean? Because he's, he's the adhesive to all that stuff, right? Um, and then doing these workshops with kids where they could come in and do, it's in a way it's like a masterclass workshop where like if you're a kid you could come and make like a weird Air Force One with like Shane and Ian from Hood by Air, you know? Um, and then I brought in uh, Callie and Brendan from somewhere and election reform to also do one based around t-shirts and Heron Preston came in and did one about zines, you know? So um, the reason I mentioned that is, you know, the real magic during those three days happened in the workshops, you know? So like you would have like Ferg hanging out in one corner and Yachty in another corner and then you had like some random kid from the Bronx like working on a fucking t-shirt and Virgil's hanging out and, and it, like no one was Instagram, no one was doing social media like yeah, all they were the kids busy working. Were, they were busy working and having conversations you know what I mean like kids were like le legitimately like running up on me and being like what was it like working for Supreme what are you doing now and it's like cool like I have no issue like talking to anyone at any given time you know what I mean like um, and, and, it, and that was kind of like across the board, like, you know, Tremaine from No Vacancy was there talking to kids. So kind of taking that momentum and that energy and I wanted to do something for Basel and I befriended uh, Craig Robbins who runs the Miami Design District. Mm -hmm. I befriended him earlier in the year and he was just like, hey, this platform is here for whatever you want to do, whenever you want to do it, you know, which is kind of amazing. and. Um, I wanted to do, you know, pretty much take that kind of like workshop mentality, you know, tangibility interaction with kids and bring in the same kind of heads, which is like at this point, like it's like home team, you know. Um, so we're gonna do like a three day, uh, I wanna say it's more like a museum gift shop. You know, like I want the feeling like if you go to like the Baldessari show or like the Basquiat show, and when you get to the very end, you get to walk away with like the one cool, like tea or mug or like tote bag. tote bag or something like that says that you went to the exhibition yeah so i'm calling this social studies and i want you know everyone ultimately will make their one like off social studies project uh or product and virgil's doing it uh tremaine from no vacancy uh adwala somewhere uh cali is going to do a limited print and making it affordable for kids you know what i mean um Let's see, Union Los Angeles, O32C, Awake. Uh, I'm also gonna start a press division for the agency. So I'm gonna print my friend's book. Uh, her name is Shaniqua Jarvis, the photographer. Uh, so we're gonna do a launch for that. And then we're gonna do workshops with Virgil, workshops with Tremaine and A-Side, uh, via Art Dad, through Converse, Nike's getting down. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, We'll do the conversations. I mean, nothing's locked in, but I would love to get like Uncle Luke to talk about like Miami Booty Base oh, wow. with Virgil and Tremaine. Um, yeah, that's um, that's the project. And do like an Art Mom Day too. Art like, Moms? Be, like, yeah, Art Moms would be like Shaniqua and the Oddwalla girls um, do something. I don't know, it's like still in the works. But Sounds like exciting. everyone's in, everyone's, like that's the shit that like gets me like, hyped, you know what I mean? Like to be able, like that's the whole point of Baca Creative is to have this platform, you know, like for people to kind of like excel and move on. You know what I mean? Like my job isn't to like, all right, come under me and I just want you guys under this umbrella. It's like, nah, like I want, I want everyone to elevate. Like this whole thing is about elevation. Together. Together yeah. as one, you know what I mean? Like the kids that come here and they work for me too. Like. I don't want them to work for me for like the next three to four years and that's it. Like I want you to like gain a skill and then go be the director of whatever it is at company X. You know what I mean? Like, cause for me, like that's the biggest reward that I can get. It's like that kid would have never gotten there if it wasn't for me. Right. Like other people don't work that way. Other people are like, no, nah, like you're talented and you stay with me forever. And you know, like, it's like, nah, man, like 
there'll be other people, you know what I mean? Like, and I, I, you know, like for me, like it's really important also for like kids of color to have a co like a place to work. You know what I mean? Like I want, you know, like me growing up, I didn't, no one told me or any, no one that looked like me told me that I could be a photographer, that I could be a stylist, that I can be a creative director, an art director, or a clothing company owner. You know what I'm saying? Like no one ever told me that. It sure as hell no one that looked like me. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's for me, that's why like I I'm very diligent with answering my DMs. You know what I mean? Across the board, you know, black, white, yellow, green, purple, whatever. You know what I mean? But I think for me that's what what's really important about this tangibility and like having a, a platform say like IG, you know what I mean? Where it's like some kid will literally hit me up from like Chicago and he's like, I'm Mexican, I don't know what to do, blah, 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 blah. You know, like my parents don't get me and I'm just like, cool, I'll take the five minutes out of my day to answer him. You know right. what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, a way that we usually interrupt uh, our podcast episodes is with like, you know, a bit of information or jewels that people can use to apply to like, you know, their career path as well. Um, you mentioned like, you know, when you were coming up that you didn't, you didn't have someone tell you that you can be all of those things. What what would be something that you would give as like, you know, a gem to Angelo back then when you first started? Um, shit. Um, save your money. <laughs> yeah, just save your money, you know, like you're gonna need it. Um, and then, I mean, it's not really for me back then, but I think because I, I, I had it. If I didn't have it, I wouldn't have been able to make it this far. You know, for me, like what's most important to tell kids that are uh, hustling and grinding right now is to continue and to just work with, like to get here, it's hard work. It's not just like, it's not a quick flip and it doesn't happen in, you know, a week or 30 days and it might not happen in a year. You know what I mean? Like for me, like this, it took me 20 years to get to this point. And the whole point of me being here is, is absolutely to show you how to do it, and it should take you half the time. You know what I mean? And not saying that everyone has to put in 10 years from other people, it might happen faster. There's definitely kids out there that are probably much more talented than I am, and it might take them five years, but ultimately at the core of it is hard work. It's hard work, you know what I mean? Like you could definitely charm your way through the front door, but that doesn't mean that you know you earn your seat at the table. You know, like to earn your seat at the table, it takes a lot of fucking hard work. Perfect. Yeah, that's a perfect ending point. Thanks so much for your time, man. Thank you for bringing yeah. us in here. Thank you for talking Thank you. about everything. Yeah, Thank man. For Thank you, guys. Dropping a couple gems. Yeah. Awesome.